Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I know uh, it's difficult to keep awake after lunch, so I'm going to make it light and easy for you. I'll have a short presentation, and based on the presentation, I want you to start writing your questions, because I don't know exactly the extent of your knowledge or your familiarity with my part of the world, which is 16 flying hours away from Berlin. <coughs> and uh, so I, first of all, would like to thank uh, Mark uh, Donfried for inviting me again. He never gets tired of me. I used to speak here about, uh, what, 10 years ago, eight years ago, seven years ago, five years ago. So I'm a regular, if you would say, customer of the ICD. And I always uh, say that you can't talk about global issues without including Asia in your radar screen. Uh, so far, I think we have been quite Eurocentric for the past two days. Uh, so I'd like to uh, take you on a holiday to Southeast Asia, where the sun is uh, there all the time. And uh, I will not just speak, I will not speak about the Philippines because uh, in 2015, a group of 10 countries will be officially becoming one community called the ASEAN community. I would like to uh, congratulate also Mark for this uh, building. I know the old building, I used to have art shows there. I used to have uh, uh, dialogues there. I used to bring some of the ambassadors in Berlin to get to know the young people because we have a tendency to speak to each other only. And so it was a uh, wonderful opportunity. And I hope that you who are attending the ICD will take advantage of your being in Berlin because Berlin is one of the cities in the world where you find nearly all the countries represented. So I would uh, advise you to take a good look at that because uh, not many capitals in the world would have as many diplomatic missions as you would have in Berlin. Uh, I would like to relate what my few words will be on the theme of the uh, of the season, World Without Walls, because I think we are all here to be reinvigorated about the uh, importance of the fall of the wall in Berlin. But perhaps many of you are, may not yet have been born in 1986, when the Philippines had its version of people power. In 1986, millions of Filipinos, you know, Manila is a city of 15 million people. The Philippines is a country of 100 million people. So it's easy to gather 15 million people to assert themselves and get rid of a leader whom they believe was no longer responsive. And so people power was a very strong uh, movement that I th believe was a uh, means for us in Asia to change a regime without hurting anyone. And uh, the uh, crowds that went on Bornheimer Strasse, for example, for me, was like a playback of the events that happened in 1986 in the Philippines. Uh, I know history of Asia is very far from you, but I'm just trying to uh, remind you that out there, we, in as early as 86, we had our own people power. And the woman leader who succeeded uh, President Marcos was Cori Aquino. And she symbolized her campaign with a yellow ribbon because of the song, Tie a Yellow Ribbon 
There's nothing ideological about it. There was nothing philosophical about it. But it was one way to express that people were united, that they were all one in getting rid of a leader that was no longer responsive to the country's needs. So she was elected in 1986 after people power. And in 1989, the German government invited her to Bonn. Bonn was then the capital of the Federal Republic of Germany. And I was chargé at that time. And in those days, every leader who would come to Germany for a state visit will be taken to Berlin. And there's a nice spot in Berlin that guests are made to look at the other side of the fence of the wall to see how awful it was on the other side. Oh, this is part of a Cold War uh, situation. And I remember very clearly, after we climbed the stairs to see East Berlin, remember this was July 1989. We had a press conference with the Burgermeister at the time, Senator Momper, M-O-M-P-E-R. And he still plays an important role in the history of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And we asked him, Mr. Momper, you have shown us the wall. Do you think that wall will ever fall down? His answer was, and I reminded him recently, oh, definitely, someday it will fall but not in our lifetime. That was July 1989. November 1989, the wall fell. So this is really something that, for us, diplomats then in Bonn never anticipated. But one has to remember that, and I'm glad that we're going to listen to German foreign policy later on, that high on the agenda of Germany in those days was the reunification of the country. So it was really a very meaningful event for Germany. So that was 19, so I told you about 1986, July 1989, November 1989. 2009, I was ambassador to Berlin, and that was the 20th anniversary of the fall of the wall. And we were invited at the Friedrichstadtpalast uh, celebration. And we could dialogue with Chancellor Kohl, with Mr. Gorbachev, and President Bush. So the events last night brought back vivid memories for me. And I thought I'd share them with you today. And it may be linked to prepare your minds about how we in Asia also broke barriers and in order to build what we now call the ASEAN community. When you say ASEAN, you're talking about how many countries? Can somebody tell me? No? More than 20. I give a prize to whoever makes it. Anyone? Somebody said 15. Somebody said? More than 20. <laughs> well, the winner is 10. Yeah. Uh, I ask this so that you will remember, because in many cases, people forget. Uh, however, when you say ASEAN, make sure it's ASEAN, not Asian. Asian is the whole region. Now, when you say ASEAN, it's in Southeast Asia, and it's the 10 most dynamic countries in the region today. How's that for propaganda? <laughs> but uh, you better believe it, because it's true. And uh, we perhaps, uh, I, I would like to uh, outline my brief remarks on this. Uh, why ASEAN? Why did we get together? And how did we get together? What is our global engagement? And what is ASEAN today? As I told you, please keep in mind, 2015, these 10 countries will be one 
community. But for 47 years, it will be this still 47 years old, we never used a big letter C because we were not legally committed. When we signed the ASEAN Charter, this committed us to do everything that would be decided by our leaders. Uh, the build-up towards an ASEAN community really is a work in progress. It's not that when 2015 comes, everything would be nice and dandy. It is a work in progress. It is held together by three pillars, the ASEAN political security community, the ASEAN economic community, and the ASEAN socio-cultural community. I didn't show you the map, otherwise you'll be able to count. So imagine these are the countries that comprise ASEAN. Have a look. It consists of, we always do it alphabetically, so we avoid quarrels, so who comes first? First, of course, is Brunei Darussalam. Uh, second is Indonesia, uh, Cambodia. Then you have Indonesia. You have Laos. You have Malaysia. You have the F Philippines. You have Singapore. You have, oh, oh sorry, we have, uh, after Malaysia, you have Myanmar, uh, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. So these are the countries that comprise the region. If you look at it, it's, it's interesting to note immediately that there are two uh, characteristics of the, con of the 10. One is what you call the continental ASEAN, and one consisting of eight countries on the continent of Asia, and the maritime ASEAN, which is the Philippines and Indonesia. These 10 countries is, is more diverse than any other area you can think of. Our diversity ranges from geography, as I said. One is maritime, the other is uh, continental. Religion. Uh, uh, Indonesia is the biggest Islamic nation in the world today. <coughs> the Philippines is the largest Christian nation in Asia. Then you have Buddhists, you have uh, those who con uh, follow Confucius, those who are also animists, and many, many other indigenous religions. So it's really a, a basket of diversity. It's, it's such a diverse area, and you wonder how we get together. Um, however, we like to say that the uniting element is that we all eat rice. <laughs> I, I'm sorry that we skipped the, the symbol of uh, ASEAN. It is uh, 10 stalks of rice that's bound together and I remember when I was Director General of ASEAN, we were thinking about changing the uh, symbol because someone said, now we are five, then we are six, then we'll be 10. That's 10 stocks. We will look like a fat lady tightening her belt. So we said, never mind. It will all be in the mind of the onlooker. But it is very difficult to, to, to create a symbol and make it a, a, a lasting symbol which everybody will recognize at once. Now, um, what are the common features of these countries? Well, why did we get together? Traditionally, we, before colonialism, before the colonial masters came, we were all trading with each other. So the ASEAN free trade area, which will take effect next year, is nothing new, really. It just makes official what we have been practicing in the past. We were freely trading with each other. Uh, continental uh, Asia, uh, Southeast Asia with maritime Southeast Asia because there's some goods which we have and which the others don't have. So we have that culture of freely trading. 
what uh, made the division, really, is when the colonial powers came. So uh, each of us had a different colonial ruler. And after the Second World War, all the 10 started to get their own, declared their own independence. The first one was Indonesia in 1945. It declared its independence from, guess, the Netherlands. It was a colony of the Netherlands. Do you know how the Netherlands got there? Very interesting story. Because the Dutch were very traditionally going around the world. And the Dutch conquered uh, New York, uh, the, the east coast of America. Then they heard about these wonderful spice islands in Southeast Asia. And in those days, in the 16th, 14th, 15th century, spices were very important. The spices preserve food, which will be brought into the ships that will carry the people to conquer countries in, in Africa and Asia. So everybody was rushing to get to the source of these uh, wonderful spices. And the Molucas Islands, which is north of Indonesia, is very rich in spices. So what happens? The British were there already. And since the uh, Dutch had, had established themselves in New York area, they wanted to swap New York for the Moluccas. Can you imagine? I don't know if they regret having exchanged their authority over New York. And in exchange, they got the Spice Islands in the Indonesian archipelago. Indonesia consists of 15,000 islands. The Philippines consists of only 7,000 islands. So uh, there is a wonderful book on the story of the exchange of New York for a few islands that had spices. So if you look at the value of land in New York today, I'm sure the Dutch are thinking twice. Now the Philippines became a colony of the United States after the Spanish-American War in 1898. They won, uh, over, they won over Spain. Spain in the 16th century was on its way down. And they were able to conquer Cuba and the other Spanish property, which was <coughs> the Philippines. The, Spain had been in the Philippines for more than 350 years. And this explains why it is a predominantly uh, Catholic country. Anyway, I, I'm giving you this background so that you will have an idea how diverse we are and how in the world did we get together. One of the big reasons we really got together was to enable us to address our bilateral problems. We had overlapping claims over islands uh, and over areas that they sort of were in between. And the second one is that in those days, we were scared of the spread of <coughs> communism. This was a very strong reason why we decided to get together. Uh, so there are several stages, and uh, I will not run through, because otherwise we have a long story. Uh, in 1967, the five foreign ministers of the five founding members, which is uh, the Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore, decided we better get together because individually we will not be able to defend ourselves from the incursion, from the spread of communism, which was already in Vietnam, and this was the glorious revolution in China. And the second was that uh, we were scared of fortress Europe. We were scared of NAFTA. And we decided, hey, let's get together so uh, we could be a better player in the region. We have devised a way to really get into agreement. And, and this is what I think is very important today, that wh why were you not quarreling? Why are you not fighting each other? 
we have found a way, uh, we call it a consensus building, and it is a very deep cultural practice called mushawara and mufakat. Uh, those of you who speak uh, Malay will understand. It is consultation. There's a lot of consultation and before you come to a consensus uh, building uh, situation. And I think this is what explains why we, we don't fight over things, we, we discuss things, even if we all speak different languages. But uh, this is something that uh, we are very lucky. In the EU, you have all the languages. We all decided it's too expensive to speak everybody's language. So we said, let's decide, even if English is not our national language, it's the international language, so we better all speak English. And that was decided, and I think it was a practical uh, decision. We have decided on four things uh, for our ASEAN free trade area, to facilitate trade and investment, the free flow of goods, services, movement of persons, and free flow of capital. So those are the four basic agreements that we have made to enable the community to glue it together. Uh, It doesn't move. It wants me to stop. It wasn't me. So let me take you now to who we are today. More, more, more. Anyway, yeah. what are we today? We are, if we were a single country, if ASEAN were a single country today, we would be the seventh largest economy in the world with a combined GDP of 2.4 trillion out of, since uh, out of uh, 2013 statistics. We have the population of 600 million 100 million more than the EU, I think. The third largest labor force found in the world with very high educational skills, with a 60% growth from productivity gains. So those are what makes ASEAN uh, region today a very attractive country that uh, is worth considering for you to have a good look, to perhaps study. Uh, if you're looking for a year gap in your studies, come to us. We have excellent schools. We uh, can provide that uh, un uh, studies for you to understand how the region works. And to keep peace with our neighbors, we have what we call dialogue partnerships. China, Japan, and Korea are our closest dialogue partners. Why it's important for us, not only strategically, but economically. But I would like perhaps to end this by saying that uh, the EU has been a major partner of ASEAN. We have been working very closely with, especially with Germany. And when I was ambassador here, I gave a title to Mr. Hans Dietrich Genscher as the father of ASEAN-EU relations. And since then, he has loved us. I think he always loves us because we have excellent beer in the Philippines. Anyway, we believe that uh, our main characteristic is that there is unity in diversity. And this is the lesson we have learned to be united in spite of our diversity. And it has kept us together for the past 47 years. We will celebrate our 50th anniversary in 2017, when ASEAN will be 50 years old. So thank you, and I'd like to hear your questions. <laughs>